Okay, um, I hope people can hear me fine. Um, yeah, so I'll be mostly talking about uncertainties. And, and then after I'm done, I'll, it will be followed by Raymond, who will cover additional topics. And then we will have one big hands on at, at the end for, for both of these topics. Okay. And remember, if you have questions, ask in, the, in this channel, August 4th. The, the one with today's date. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, let us remind ourselves uh, what are the big pictures of patient analysis. And if you need more details, you can see the extra from previous two days. There are a lot of details. And this is just a big picture to remind ourselves where how different pieces fit together. So uh, from the very far away view, this is what we want to do. We have model and we have data and we want to do some analysis machinery to compare them and to, to get something out of it. So this is the goal and we can zoom in a little bit to see a little bit more details on how we do it. Uh, so when we zoom in, we can first, we see that uh, we don't really compare model directly we do calculation from the model and then we compare the calculation to data. And then in the analysis machinery, there's uh, one uh, special piece, I think it's the key, which is the posterior function, uh, if we're talking about patient formalism. And this posterior function essentially encodes all the information about the parameters that we, we can learn from this set of data. Okay. Then uh, let's zoom in a little bit more again. So on the calculation side, we see that the calculation is expensive. So uh, we cannot possibly run calculation for all possible parameter points. That's just not feasible in heavy ion collisions. So what we do is we calculate for some set of points and then we interpret it to, to reduce CPU usage. It's more out of necessity. Uh, but it's working well. And then the if we touch, uh, take out uh, the analysis machine even more, then we can see that the posterior is built, uh, if we're talking about Bayesian, um, based on two parts. We have, First, we have the prior knowledge of what we think the parameters should be. And then there's the compatibility function uh, to, to tell us how compatible one set of calculation is compared to data. And in the Bayesian formalism, this is the Bayesian likelihood. Okay. And now uh, let's zoom in even more. So in order to do the interpolation on the calculation side, we first need to pick some of the points to calculate, and then we do the interpolation. And those are the role of the design points. And regarding how to interpolate, uh, one of the ways is use the Gaussian process. Uh, there are also uncertainty associated with this that we need to specify. And then for the prior, there is the question of what do we choose for prior that might have an uh, effect on our results. And on the data side, there's also a question of what data we choose. And there's uh, because it's experimental data, so there are a lot of things that's associated with it. So, uh, what's the central value of data? What's the uncertainty? Uh, what's the correlation of them? And then, essentially, everything here, there's some choice in it that we have to make. And there are some uh, popular choices, uh, which is good for many cases, but it's case by case that we, we need to look further. Okay, so I think I'll stop here uh, in, in terms of zooming in and just uh, point out the core of the analysis, which is the color blocks, uh, boxes. Essentially, as I mentioned before, the, the whole goal of this analysis is really to get the posterior function. So as, uh, as soon as we have this function uh, written down and easy to calculate, we have all information. Then we can analyze the function to, to get out what we want to get. And in the patient formalism, this is involves choosing prior and uh, writing down the patient likelihood. 
and then the there are some tricks to make it traceable. Okay, so so this is really the core of the analysis, and so for today, uh, I will not talk too much about the uh, the most of the pieces, but instead I will focus on some specific piece, which is the the question of uncertainty. So you can see the uncertainties of, uh, and correlations have uh, appear a few times in, in this block. Okay, so uh, any questions so far uh, from anyone? Um, I guess not. Uh, we have been seeing this for the past few days already. So uh, let me start from the talking about uncertainty. So this really is the, the key question. So what do we mean by uncertainty? And uh, most of the things I, I see here is under the context of experimental physics. So in other disciplines, this might be a little bit different. I'm not that familiar with it, but at least in experimental physics, this is how, how it's going, how, how the case. So to talk about uncertainty, first we have to uh, introduce uh, some uh, standard objects that people usually talk about. So uh, one of them is called the likelihood function. Uh, this is not Bayesian formalism, but this is something that people talk about a lot in different contexts. So uh, there, there is this uh, likelihood function, which basically encodes how likely a set of parameter is given some observed data. Okay. So the uh, it's it's basically a function as a function of the parameter of interest theta in this case. Uh, this uh, these are the theory parameters that we want to learn, and then we put input as some observed data. For example, how many counts, uh, and what's the distribution of momentum, and and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, if we look at one example. Uh, as a counting experiment, uh, suppose we, we count number of events and we see three counts. Then the likelihood function could look like this in, in the case of Poisson statistics. And we can see that the x-axis here is the data, which is the true count. What's the true probability, uh, true, uh, true rate? And then uh, from this function, we can say something like, the most likely value is three. If we observe three, the most likely rate is three. And then uh, 5.5 is quote unquote half as likely, uh, just because this factor of two. And 8.5 is quote unquote 10% as likely in, yeah, in, in layman terms. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, there is one important thing that uh, we need to keep in mind is that there are two functions that are closely related. Uh, so the first one is the probability density function. So th this function is basically if we have a fixed uh, theory parameter, in this case, the number of counts for rate, and what is the distribution of well, what we might see in data? In this case, the Poisson distribution. And the likelihood function looks very similar if you look at just the right hand side, but conceptually it's reversed. So uh, in this case, the number of data uh, that we observe is given, but we write as a function of the uh, true parameters that we want to learn. Okay, so uh, a few more examples of the difference. So on the left hand side, I list example theory parameters. And on the right hand side, this example observed data. So, for example, uh, if we flip coins, the probability of head for every flip is the theory parameter. And the number of uh, the, the sequence of heads and tails is the observed data. Okay. And then if we have a function of the left hand side, it's the likelihood. If a function of right hand side is the probability density function. And there are also many other examples, for example, cross-section versus what we observe, and energy loss parameters versus RA, and so on. The, this list goes on forever. 
Okay, and then um, since uh, we're talking about Bayesian analysis, uh, in the Bayesian analysis, there's something that uh, acts as a very similar role as the likelihood function in the non-Bayesian formalism. So which is the posterior function that we want to get. So in terms of the analysis, they both give very similar, uh, act as very similar role. So they give information uh, about how likely each parameter is given uh, some observed data. And there are also some differences. Uh, for example, the posterior is constructed through the base theorem and there's a probabilistic interpretation, which is generally not true if we're talking about likelihood function. But despite these differences, the role they, they act is very similar in terms of analysis. Okay. Okay, so now that we have either the likelihood or the posterior, uh, we can decide what to do with it. And so the sim simplest thing we can do is to describe the function. So we say something about how the function looks like. Uh, so for example, we can talk about the mean of the function, RMS, most probable point, and so on and so forth. And so for example, this is uh, from the counting experiment again with x equals 20. And in this case, we can say that the most probable value is 20. The mean is a bit above 21 or so. RMS is 4.5 and so on. Okay. And the reason why this is important is that, oops, is that the uncertainty is also a description of the function. And so I think this is the, probably the most important message uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for this talk, which is that at least in experimental physics, everything has an underlying distribution, whether it's the likelihood or not, uh, there's some underlying distribution. And the numbers we quote are descriptions that characterizes the function. And uncertainty is usually something that characterizes the some sort of width of the function at the core. Okay, so uh, as an example, when we say that we measure 25 plus minus five uh, from, ex from experiment, what we're really doing is we are describing the underlying function. And there are many different prescriptions on how to get this number and they can mean different things. So uh, for example, it could mean that the most probable value is 25. That's a central value. And the 68% most likely interval is 20 to 30. That's where the plus minus like five come from. Or uh, another quite commonly seen prescription is from the likelihood formalism. It could mean that the range from 20 to 30 has likelihood value above some threshold. Okay. And in some cases, it could be also be different. Uh, for example, it could also mean that RMS of the distribution is five and so on. So there are different prescriptions. They mean different things. And uh, let me show you uh, some concrete example. Uh, so again, we use the Poisson statistics. So suppose the prescription we use to quote the uncertainty number is that the likelihood is above this threshold. So we take the max value, scale it down by square root E, and then we take the range that's above that. And this is quite uh, commonly seen in, in many analysis. And the more common name is minus two log delta L equals one that people are using. Uh, so if we use this prescription, when x equals one, when we observe one, then the range is 0.3 to 2.3. And 20 is 15.9 to 24.8. And 100 is 90.3 to 110.3. Okay. And uh, I'll leave as an exercise what will happen with when x equals to zero. Okay. Then let, let's see another uh, prescription, which is that uh, we, we look at the most likely parameters that enclose the 68% of the area. Okay, and in this case, 
uh, we get a slightly different bound for the for the different values. And again, for x equals zero, I'll leave as an exercise to see what it is. And one thing that's uh, quite common, at least in experimental physics, is that for the all the different prescriptions, even though in many cases they might differ a little bit, but if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, they uh, the prescriptions tend to converge. So if uh, we have a normal distribution, uh, Gaussian distribution, then the prescription we choose doesn't matter that much. But as long as it's not Gaussian, then it matters more and more. Okay, and related to this is also that uh, as, soon, as soon as the, the distribution is not Gaussian, then the tails matter a lot. So uh, if you remember, the uncertainty is just one number that describes how the distribution looks like. And it's usually the, the width of the core of the distribution. And there are often times we need to go beyond a single uncertainty number. Uh, so for example, we can ask ourselves the question, uh, if somebody reported one plus or minus 0 0.25 for some measurement, uh, how compatible is it with zero? So naively, one would say that zero is like four times this number away, so it's not very compatible. Um, but the, the real answer is we really don't know. Okay, so there is not enough information in these two numbers to tell us the answer of how this, how compatible this is with zero. So in this case, we, we will need more information to, to judge this. Okay, and the, so uh, as a more concrete example of the, how the tails might look like. So uh, here's the result of one of uh, one measurement where we measured the, the beyond standard model Higgs couplings to, to zero sum. So if we look at Lagrangian, we have the HZZ, the standard model part, and then we have the higher order CP even and CPR part, okay? And this analysis measures the size of these higher order terms, which in standard model is extremely small. Okay, and on the left-hand side, the color shows you the, essentially the likelihood value and uh, the minus of log of that. So large number means less likely. And the y-axis is the size of the CP even term. The x-axis is the size of CP hot term. And we can see that the, this has a very highly non-trivial shape. So imagine if we want to just quote one number out of this, uh, I think it's impossible. And we really need uh, more information to really describe the result of this uh, measurement. Okay, so as a brief summary on this part, uh, so the posterior uh, function in the Bayesian formalism or the likelihood function in, in other formalism uh, basically encodes how likely a parameter is, is true given the observed data. And we also have the quote unquote probability density function, which is the reverse of this. Okay. And these two are different things, and we, we shouldn't mix them up. Uh, secondly, the uncertainty, uh, at least in the experimental physics, they can be mean many things. And essentially, it's a description of the underlying function. So it describes how the function looks like. And there are many common prescriptions, uh, unfortunately. So for each measurement, they, they can follow different prescriptions and quote different things. However, the good thing is that if things are Gaussian, then they tend to give the same number. So the, it's not as bad as uh, I made it to be because many things are Gaussian because of the, like central limit theorem and so on. And finally, the tails matter a lot uh, if you want to talk about uncertainties. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Okay.
no questions or people cannot hear me anymore. I hope it's the, the form. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yeah. There's no questions on Slack so far. Okay, great. Cool. Okay, then uh, let me move on to the next part, which is about the correlation, because that's one important thing about the uncertainties that we need to take care of. Okay, uh, so uh, one important thing to interpret the result is that to, uh, to recall that the uncertainties are in general correlated to some degree. Uh, even if the, we are talking about very different things, they will still be correlated uh, uh, more, uh, to, to some degree. And so in, in this case, for example, if you're measuring the branching fraction of some particle to diff two different channels, then there will be correlation. Because if one goes up, the other one has to go down. They, they, they all add up to one. Right? So in this case, uh, if we plot the observable one versus two, then we will see this, this kind of shape. It's anti-correlated. And the correlation also matters a lot uh, if we want to interpret the result. Uh, so for example, if we have uh, something like this, we have two data points with these uncertainties, and we have the prediction that just touches the top part of it. And we want to know the agreement between the prediction versus the data point. And this uh, agreement depends a lot on the degree of correlation between the uncertainties. So if the, the uncertainty is fully correlated, meaning that the, if one point goes up, the other one also goes up and vice versa then it's, uh, it's quote unquote one sigma effect. It's like one error bar away. If it's not correlated, meaning that they, they can move up and down independently, then it's quote unquote two sigma effect, roughly. It's like two uncertainty away. And if it's anti-correlated, this can be very significant. So if it's uh, sufficiently anti-correlated, this could already be uh, a discovery like five sigma discovery. And it's very crucial that in our analysis, we have to faithfully cap capture the correlation as much as possible. Okay, and so uh, correlation is also everywhere. So for example, if we look at some uh, recent results from different experiments, usually you can see something like this. So there is the, this quote-unquote correlated uncertainty, which tells you that uh, the size of these blocks are correlated across different points. And the, these kind of correlation can arise by, from many things. For example, if you have a jet energy scale, uh, then everything moves up and down at the same time, and, and so on. Okay. And as another example, which is a bit more extreme, uh, here is the calibration of jet energy scale. So we measure jet energy scale using different channels. So we have photon plus jets and Z plus jets and, and so on. And the measurements are done with uh, very different things. So the, the object is different. So one look at photon, one look at Z. The analysis is independent. They have different codes. Uh, different people doing analysis, and essentially everything is different except the jets. And however, uh, if if we look closely and we want to combine the results, uh, we, we have to notice that the photon used the electromagnetic calorimeter, Z goes to electron, which also uses electromagnetic calorimeter. And this correlation has to be taken into account. Uh, if we want to get down to like 1% uncertainty of jet energy scale, otherwise it's impossible. And so the uh, capturing uncertainty between very different things, different analysis is also very important. 
Okay, so as a real life example of how things might look like, here is a one uh, measurement from TMS. This is the Hadron RA. So here we can see that there are different components. First, there's the totally correlated uncertainty. So we have the TA uncertainty uh, coming from the nuclear overlap and also luminosity uncertainty. And uh, for this TA uncertainty, uh, it could be even be correlated across uh, experiments if they use the same calculation. Okay. And then uh, other than that, we see that there are, for each point, there's the box, which is the systematic uncertainties. And then there's a line for statistical uncertainty. Okay. So in heavy iron uh, results, these are usually how, how things are broken down. So there's the uh, overall correlated piece, and then there are the statistical uncertainty, and then the rest. Okay, and then follow, uh, continuing the correlation is everywhere trend. So even the statistical uncertainty is correlated. Okay. So uh, if you do unfolding, for example, then it will be correlated. Uh, so for example, if you have, if you measure 100 events in one bin before unfolding, then after unfolding, there will be some parts that's feed down from higher values and some parts that's feeding up from, higher, uh, from lower values. And the feed down and feed up have to add up 100, because that's what we measure. And this causes the negative correlation between the higher part and the lower part. And this is largely unavoidable if you have resolution effects. And this is a very, if we look at, for example, this is one example for measuring jet PT spectra. Uh, we see these. Uh, so what's plotted here, the color is the correlation coefficient. Uh, positive means that it's positively correlated. Negative means that it's anti-correlated. And there are all the, always these uh, negative band that's uh, surrounding the, the diagonal. And that's essentially just coming from the fact that feeding down and feeding up has to add up to set value. So it's the statistical uncertainty is usually also correlated and it's unavoidable in my opinion. Okay, and uh, one more example of the impact of a correlation. So here is uh, some result from uh, some recent result from Atlas collaboration. So they use uh, vector boson plus jets, PT bar, and inclusive jets to measure the PDF. And in this case, they they try to turn on and off the correlation of uncertainty across different measurements. So whether there is correlated uncertainty between PT bar and inclusive jets, for example, or not. And this is the result they see. So on the left is the example of a uh, valence quark, and on the right is an example of the C quark. So red is the nominal value with correlation, and the blue is uh, what will happen if we do not take correlation into account. So especially in the case for the C quark, uh, you can see that, first of all, the uncertainty blows up a lot for the final value. And not only that, the central value also differs a lot if we don't take correlation into account. So when we do uh, uh, analysis that look at data, it's very important that we take into account as much as possible the correlation between uncertainties. Okay, so um, any questions so far? Okay. Could you return to slide 30, please? Uh, to which one? 30. Oh, I didn't one. understand well what you mean by feed down and feed up. Ah, OK. So um, you know there are detector effects. So if the true value uh, is something, then after detector effects, it will be smeared, right? 
And so, okay. yeah. And so the unfolding is try to undo the smearing. And uh, so, so if you if we measure hundred GB jet uh, in the detector level, then some of them will come from ninety GB jets, just because fluctuation goes up, and some of them will be hundred ten GB jets, and because fluctuation goes down. Okay, but it's a random effect, right? Yes. Okay. And okay. the amount that goes up and the amount that goes down is constrained. They have to add up to what we what we see in data. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. There's two numbers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, then let me move on. So the final little bit is about an example of how we might take the correlation into account in Bayesian analysis. Uh, so in order to be more concrete, uh, we, we have to go to uh, some specific example. So what I'm talking about so far is very gener generic and it doesn't, it's not, it depends not too much about whether we're doing Bayesian analysis or not. But from this point on, it's, uh, it's in the context of Bayesian analysis. Okay, so uh, in order to model the correlation, first, uh, we need to choose a compatibility function uh, between data and calculation. And so for example, we can choose the multivariate Gaussian. This is one popular choice to start with. Uh, in this case, we have the, this is the form. We have data minus calculation uh, times the matrix that encodes uncertainty information. Okay, and the keyword here really is choose. So if you choose different uh, a different way to write down this compatibility function, then everything here will look different. But here is an example where we use the multivariate Gaussian to model things. Okay, and the metrics in in between here, this sigma, big sigma, is uh, usually called the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is essentially the this is the expectation value of of this, uh, the deviation from e times of the i versus j, multiplied together, and this is essentially the analog of the variance in multi-dimension. So if you remember in one dimension, the Gaussian exponential part of Gaussian looks like this. And this is generalized to, to this for multi-dimension. And to interpret this, the off-diagonal entries are, are the, oops, the uncorrelated entries. And then if you, once you have, oops, oh no, sorry, the diagonal one, if we only have the diagonal one, it's uncorrelated, but as soon as we have off diagonal entries, it's correlated between different things. And um, in patient analysis, usually there are two different sources of the uncertainty that we have to take into account. So one is the, from the interpolation, uh, because we don't calculate the, the calculation for all parameter space, so, and we have to do interpolation. So there are some uncertainty from that. And then there is the experimental uncertainties. Okay, and at least uh, in the multivariate Gaussian case, this is one way we can build uh, the uncertainty matrix. So the focal variance matrix can be decomposed into different pieces. So we have the uncorrelated pieces, plus the somewhat correlated piece, and plus what, uh, and so on and so forth. And this can be done like for different systematic concerning sources, for example. And then we can also take one step further and calculate the, the co covariance matrix across different measurements. And so, for example, we can correlate the luminosity uncertainty from the same experiment. 
and, and so on. Okay, and finally, one word about the experimental uncertainties is that uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that the information from experiments are is all often limited. So that we publish certain set of information and then for the rest, people are forced to make, make guesses about what they are. And then in order to deal with that in the patient analysis, there are generally two ways to go. Uh, one way is that we write out that as a caveat of the analysis we perform. So we say that we perform this analysis under the caveat that we also assume this correlation for, for this thing. Okay. And then the, the other way to go is uh, we vary the correlation, uh, like uh, try to change the, the, our guesses. And then we record additional uncertainties on the extracted parameters. So both of these uh, I've seen people do, and it's a matter of taste which one, one, one wants to go. But th this uh, has to be addressed somehow. Okay, so now uh, uh, let me move to the, my summary. Okay, so uh, the summary uh, of this whole talk is that first of all, uh, what, for the Bayesian analysis, one of the key components is to the choice of compatibility function and also the uncertainty treatment. And when we talk about uncertainty in experimental physics at least, uh, the uncertainty is uh, really a description of some underlying distribution. And there are multiple common prescriptions that people use for different analysis. And next, the uh, correlations are very important. And they, whether to include that or not, can change the, our analysis a lot. But sometimes we have to make guesses because of the amount of information from its experiment. Okay, and then finally, I show you one example of how we treat uncertainty. And I think this will be more concrete once we have the hands-on session uh, later by, by Raymond. Okay, so that's uh, all from me. Uh, any questions? Uh, no questions on Slack, uh, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. No questions? No? All right, thanks, Yi. Um, so is the plan to have Raymond present next? And then you guys do like a hands-on after, right? Uh, yeah, we, we can decide whether we want the few minute break or we go directly to Raymond. Yeah, I, so how long is Raymond? So Raymond is going to be around an hour as well, right? So I have some, I have some slides, which I think will take I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes and then the hands on okay. stuff. Yeah. So uh, I think it'd be a break, right? but otherwise fun. Okay, that sounds good. Um, actually, why don't uh, Raymond, you go first and then after your uh, 20 to 30 minutes and then we can have maybe like 50 minute break and then go to the hands on. Yeah. Sure, that sounds fun. Awesome. Um, let me just move some slides around here on the second. Um, uh, can you can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Great. Um I think I have the wrong set of slides here. So one sec. Are, are you able to see my slides? So it's just pause. I'm sure I have the right. Can you see them? Not yet. It says no. it's uh, you started sharing, but we don't see the screen. Yet. That's odd. I've never seen this one before in <laughs> all the years of Zoom now. Uh, let me. Why don't you try, try it? Again? And, yeah, sorry. Let me try and reopen the presentation. Maybe something sure. is stuck. Uh, uh, 
Um, let's see. Okay, now it says it's sharing. Uh, ah, okay, it's something yes, that's not on the monitor. Yes. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, now okay, I will just I will just look at it over here and. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I guess you'll see a lot of my neck. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So, hello, everyone. Um, so, I'm going to uh, try, try to build on on Eve's lecture from today. Uh, basically, uh, following up with with uh, some general content about Bayesian inference and heavy inclusions, um, but with a little bit more of a focus on the the hard sector. Um, and then we'll yeah we'll move to some hands on fairly quickly. So, there are our, our Say two and a half things that I'd like to, to cover for today. Um, so one is I'd like to discuss a little bit about just Bayesian uh, parameter extraction from Jetscape in the hard sector. A little bit of focus on some of the details to give you uh, a little bit of sense of how these things uh, work. Uh, additionally, uh, from kind of the practical side, um, giving you a little bit different perspective than what you saw in the soft sector yesterday from way out, for example. Um, and then uh, I want to introduce to you this this so-called Bayesian uh, or sorry this Jetscape stat package, uh, which uh, is a piece of software that that really helps you kind of run uh, Bayesian analyses in a more organized manner. So uh, really using the exact same techniques as you've seen from the last uh, few days from uh, from Irene and Simon and and Weyau, but now uh, kind of put together as a as a package. Um, and this is really, well, you'll get some hands-on experience then with, with kind of the code that we, we actually use for some of our analyses here. Um, in the process, you'll extract some parameters for uh, a toy model we have of our, our DiJet asymmetry, uh, HA. So uh, to kind of start on the first topic, uh, to think about Bayesian analyses in the hard sector, I'm an experimentalist, so I, I often think about this from kind of an experimental perspective. Um, and so I, I have this, this collage of all these different experimental jet results um, you know, many of them RA, but many of them other variations up to including substructure, uh, DiJet asymmetries, all kinds of information here, both from uh, unfolded, un unfolded jet measurements as well as hadrons and many more than I can show here. And, uh, you know, we've been working on this for quite some time, but really recently in the last, last few years, I think we really ended up with quite a broad collection of, of results. And we can ask how we try and make sense of these in the hard sector. And unsurprisingly, I'm going to suggest we should try and do some Bayesian analyses to really try and uh, see if we can extract uh, some coherent information uh, to for you know, make sense of all of this. So uh, to kind of jump right in, in terms of the way that we think about this in the hard sector. So uh, our, our problems are a little bit different than, than what you saw, for example, yesterday. So in general, we, we tend to have a little bit smaller uh, Parameter space. I'll show you, I'll show you our parameterization in a moment, but it tends to be kind of on the order of five to seven compared to say the the uh, sixteen parameters that were shown yesterday. Um, however, that being said, we still have a high computational cost, but in a different way, right? So, uh, in in for these these soft uh, sector analyses, you have these mini core uh, simulations giving you a, a you know kind of order uh, thousand core hours or more. Uh, per design point um, uh, focused on, on basically single nodes um, where you need really this inner process communication. In the case of, of, the, uh, of this JET problem at the, in the hard sector, uh, we again have these, these very high com computation requirements, but we uh, are doing this instead from a kind of massively parallel perspective. Every process takes a long time to run, but we don't need strong inner process communication. Um, one way or another, one needs kind of millions of core hours to try and run this, uh, these types of simulations. This is, of course, uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, one has to have their computing resources to be able to do at least some subset of these analyses. Um, so because, of course, these, these uh, analyses are so expensive, as we've already seen, uh, right, we take advantage of running our subset of analyses for some particular set of design points, then using our, our Gaussian process simulator to, to to interpolate between uh, the points to then give us the opportunity to, to really explore our parameter space and get to our posterior distributions. So uh, in terms of kind of where our analyses are, um, the hard sector is, uh, you know, we, we've gotten started, but we're, we're catching up a little bit to the sophistication in the soft sector. Um, and so uh, the one I think I can really highlight most clearly here is, is kind of as a first step, uh, proof of principle in this, this sector, we've worked on a, an analysis focusing on, on calibrating on Hadron RAA. 
So just Hadron RAA for two centralities at both RIC and, uh, and the LHC. And uh, by doing this, it really gives us a, an environment in which we can you know, work on our methods, ensure this is really something that we can successfully work with in the hard sector, um, and uh, you know, try and extract some information in the process as a, as a proof of principle here. So uh, the details here, maybe we can gloss over a little bit, but I'll, at least we'll say that uh, in doing this, we've done some comparison between different models that you've heard about this week, or perhaps last week as well, uh, focusing on both uh, using LBT, matter, and, and a combination of this, this multi-stage approach, which we've discussed. And uh, for these, these type of calibration analyses to at least try and keep our, our computing within reason, uh, we propagate through through two plus one pre-computed hydrodynamics. Um, you know, of course, uh, uh, to to run really a full uh, hydro event by event would be uh, infeasible uh, in terms of computation. So we know, of course, from from all our Bayesian discussion, we did explore our full parameter space, and so in this case, we use a parameterization for Q hat, right? The so-called jet transport coefficient, characterizing um, the the transverse momentum kick. Uh, for partons propagating through the medium per unit length. And so uh, to focus on particularly here, so we use with four to five parameters for this analysis. So again, on a little bit smaller scale, um, and you don't have to necessarily uh, pay very close attention to everything that's going on here, but basically we have two different complementary terms. One uh, looking at the high virtuality phase, so perhaps something oriented more towards matter, uh, and one where that's more uh, hard thermal loop-like, Scattering off some some temperature medium with temperature T uh, that's more perhaps LBT like and some potential switch between them, and so this is the the concept that we try and use for this this uh, to to prove our principle here. So uh, we've of course seen seen this conceptually, but uh, in, in even some examples. But I think it's still nice to to see the uh, the way we step through this. So we of course start with our our prior distributions. Uh, trying to explain, trying to, so here we have our, our hadron RAA as a function of PT uh, from RIC uh, and the two different energies, the LHC, 2.76 and 5 TeV. Uh, and we have these two different selections, both for a central and semi-central uh, data in blue and red, respectively. We say our priors uh, seem to at least give us a chance to, to describe our data here. We can then do our uh, we, we then do our Bayesian analysis, and I'm, I'm skipping over some details for a moment. Uh, so that we can at least try and look at the data. And so this is the particular case for LBT, for example. And uh, there, there's some things worth thinking about here that you, if you're doing analysis yourself, you really want to keep in mind. Namely that, right, the, the details of your model uh, matter not just for how you extract the physics, but really for how well you're able to describe the data. Um, so, right, if in this particular case, uh, for certainly some parts of the phase space, the model describes, the posterior describes the data reasonably well. But there definitely are some regions of tension we should keep an eye on. We, of course, can turn this around the other way and also uh, think about, for example, what data might have a more positive impact uh, on these types of analyses. And so, for example, if you look here, particularly in the semi central, you see such large uncertainties uh, in this measurement uh, that it really doesn't give us the opportunity to be able to constrain our, our data or our, our extraction more, uh, more precisely. So, right, you really have these, these interplay of these two different things. Um, so, okay, so we, we've done it. If, we've, if we do our Bayesian analysis correctly, um, then uh, we can then, for example, look at our, our parameters that we extract here. Um, and uh, so what I show on the right here are these, these individual and joint distributions um, for each parameter, right? In this case, I'm comparing LBT in the red and matter in the blue. And so we can see the individual distributions or the joint distributions for the various cases here and there. And uh, I'm sure you've already done this some, but uh, you know it's always worth staring at these plots for a while uh, to try and try and make sense of them. One uh, thing you could, for example, pull out here is based on this this parameterization here, uh, ignoring this this Q switch for a moment. We see, for example, that uh, in the case of matter, there's generally a preference for this higher value for A, which is our coefficient on this high virtuality region, whereas for for LBT. We see a bit higher preference for this uh, C parameter, which is proportional to the HCL -like parameter, more more similar to kind of the uh, the virtuality range in which LBT uh, is, is is valid. And so we see uh, right. So we can already kind of try and pick out these these different uh, features that at some level reflect uh, features or parameterization, but uh, 
right, nonetheless, uh, gives us some physics that we can try and interpret out of this. Um, we can also look at our multi-stage model. And uh, there's, again, lots to pull out of here. But what I want to highlight in this case is that, again, you want to be cognizant not only your physics model, but also the data, right? So that where we were looking just a moment ago at the, the RIC data, for example, we saw that the uncertainties were quite large. And so if we then try and do the analysis, only taking the LHC data, only taking the RIC data, and the combination of them together, we see basically that uh, the, the combination, the red and, and uh, sorry, the combination of the two in the red and the LHC in the blue basically follow each other. And the green from uh, RIC uh, generally provides little constraints on our, on our parameters now in this case in our multi-stage model. Um, so again, you need to be cognizant of, of, of these two different pieces and how they can interplay to, in, an, in an actual analysis. So, um, Okay, with that, then we can we can then take our, our posterior distribution, we can undo our, our transforms in terms of our, our PCAs and, and uh, everything that we've done in the analysis, then translate back to our QHAT parameterization that I showed in the last few slides. And we can do this and we can try and, for example, extract uh, the dependence of our, our jet transport coefficient as a function of temperature. Uh, again, there's a lot that you can, can draw out of this. I will just uh, highlight a few details, one of which is if you compare our posterior distributions here, showing the different colors as a function of temperature versus our, our, uh, our prior distributions here, you can see that we've, we've extracted some significant uh, constraints in terms of our, our Q hat dependence. So we have seen at least successfully this, this approach uh, works in the, in the hard sector as well with the, the models we have available, again, up to the caveats of, of how well our, our models are able to describe our, our measured data. Uh, we see that we're consistent with some previous extractions, which is of course always reassuring. Um, and we see that in general, uh, our, our, different, uh, our, our different models are at least uh, consistent with each other in terms of the parameterization extracted. So uh, there's lots more you can extract out of here. There's the paper if you wanna go read it, but I just wanted to highlight this as, as, kind, of a, um, as kind of the first steps that we're making in the, in the hard sector in terms of our, our analyses. Now, the next step here is to look at for example, to make a to try and expand this to, for example, add the inclusive jet as well as the Hatron RAA, and that's the direction we're going right now. Uh, it's a work in progress analysis, so I don't want to spend too much time on this here, but I wanted to give a very brief sneak peek because uh, clearly we've we've substantially expanded now uh, in terms of the observables that we have available. Trying to take a really uh, experiment agnostic approach, you want to try and be as inclusive as you can with your observables. Uh, you know, unless you have a very good reason to exclude one, you want to try and include it. And tension, for example, between experiments is not a good reason to exclude the data. Um, right. So uh, here, uh, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but basically we have our inclusive pattern in Jet RIA from, uh, again, RIC uh, and LHC. Uh, there are some additional complications this time because, for example, we have, uh, you know, multiple measurements across different uh, Square root s and centrality from the same experiment. Uh, so we need to, uh, you know, take some care in how we treat the uncertainties uh, using exactly the techniques that you just described. Um, but uh, yeah, this is still very much a work in progress. So there's a lot of information here. I wanted to just highlight a few things, which is that, for example, at 200 GeV, uh, again, we can see in this newest analysis we're somehow constrained by. Uh, our uncertainties. So one thing you can try and do is see if you can expand your model out to uh, ranges where your data is, uh, uh, you know, has, has smaller uncertainties. Although one needs to be, you know, do this with care to make sure that you're not moving out of a region of validity for your model, for example. Um, one can also try and uh, uh, look more closely, for example, comparing the Hadron Jet RAA at 5 TeV, where our, our uncertainties tend to be a little bit smaller and we have these broader ranges. And you can see that there, there starts to be some tension between your hadron RA, where our posterior in this case tends to underpredict, and our jet, uh, where it, it's more constrained by these, these small uncertainties. Uh, you can look at it in a different way. And uh, if you focus closely on, so this is comparing the hadron uh, RA on the left and the jet RA on the right. And what you can see is if you kind of focus in, it's really picking up on these, these small uncertainties. So this really uh, should drive home the message that, that he was, uh, was telling you that the treatment of these uncertainties is really very critical, right? If, for example, uh, okay, uh, you know, if you have the same experiment or at the same square root S and 
and these uncertainties scale up and down together, right? This could give you a very different result than if they're totally uncorrelated. So, uh, you know, it's very important to try and try and uh, understand these and uh, and you know do your best to estimate what they are, ideally uh, provided uh, by the experiments. So. Uh, Bottom line, right? Detailed study is really critical here. This is a work in progress, so I don't want to spend more time on it. But I wanted to give you just a little bit sneak peek to show that you know our sophistication is increasing here. There's a lot to be done, um, and uh, there's a lot of information to be gained by uh, you know trying to expand our, our set of observables here and, and what we can extract. So uh, here I'm going to pause for a moment to ask if there are any questions uh, from folks. Um, nothing on Slack so far, nothing on Zoom. Um, but if you all have any questions, that would be asked. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll keep going here. Of course, if you have questions uh, as we keep going, we can always go back um, and move through that pretty quickly because uh, I think it's nice to be aware of what the, the measurements are. But, um, you know, I think uh, most critically here often is to you know, get the experience in the hands on. So I don't want to spend too much time here. So uh, the second, right, starting towards the second piece of, of what we want to discuss is um, about the so-called Jetscape stat package, uh, which is a package for Bayesian parameter estimation. Um, so what is this? Why do we care? Well, I already said a little bit. So this is this is really um, this is the statistical analysis package that that Jetscape has has provided. Uh, it's freely available on GitHub. You can click the link here, or just go to this, uh, you know, Jetscape slash stat, and you see already the the Bayesian analysis code here. Um, it's a, a Python based package, and uh, and kind of packages up all these different pieces uh, um, that you've you've seen over the last few days. So, for example, if you go, uh, you know, compare some of the the code um, that uh, you know you used yesterday, for example, during the hands on. We'll see, in fact, a lot of this is, is kind of contained one way or another within this package. Uh, this has uh, you know, been a product of many, many authors um, spanning over you know, a number of years. Um, and uh, because of that, there's, there's a few idiosyncrasies which we'll go through today, but also means that there's really um, you know, a lot of experience included in there and uh, gives you the opportunity to really start working with uh, you know, Bayesian analyses in a little bit more formal way. Um, which is particularly critical as you scale. So, you know, larger analyses where you're including more observables uh, and, uh, you know, more experimental data, more calculations, et cetera. Um, one of those really critical pieces is that there is a standardized input file format. Um, and this may sound like a, a detail that's not terribly interesting, but it turns out that it's, it's really can be quite critical. Um, if you, I'll go through this in a moment, but for example, if you think about the HEP data files from the experiments, if they're already there, um, which they often are, but not always, uh, you know, they may be storing their uncertainties in different ways between different experiments or even within different analyses from different experiments. Um, so having a way to, to, to deal with those in a standard way so you don't have to write custom code for every single uh, case already saves you a lot of time. Um, on top of that, right, you have your design point files, your parameterization files. If you want to be able to collaborate in any way, um, you know, even to the small group of you, um, you have to agree on some sort of standard um, otherwise, you know, nothing, nothing works nicely together. And so this, this package is nice because it really gives you a, uh, it gives you one standard, it gives you the tools to work with that standard and, uh, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can just use it, um, and, uh, you know, collaborate, analyze and, uh, work on, you know, the physics of interest. So, um, what does the stat package have in it? Um, so. Uh, going back to our, our picture before, which you've seen in many different ways, uh, all in, I think, different color schemes. But um, what, what STAT covers is, is, is this kind of bottom right corner here. So it, it handles things like the Gaussian process simulator, uh, it handles the Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, and we'll apply uh, everything here to be able to get you some posterior distributions and some tools to be able to work with this. Um, this is, of course, not the only way, but I think it's a, a nice, nice piece of code to work with here. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're in fact ready to go to our, our hands-on. I just want to I, I want to end with with two points of uh, consideration, things to think about. So, one, calling out directly to experimentalists. Um, you know, many of you here are uh, 
uh, you know, for example, PhD students or perhaps really postdocs, um, you really, you are the folks who are doing uh, a lot of the analysis work uh, and uh, you know, pushing results out. Uh, and one thing I really want to encourage you to think about here is to try and report your covariances for your uncertainties. Uh, if you do this, right, uh, as, as you has already described very well, right, this can have a really big impact on our ability to, to make uh, measurements um, or to make uh, extractions. Um, more simply, because reporting the full covariance may be difficult uh, for various reasons, even just reporting signed uncertainties. So taking, you know, what is the direction the uncertainty goes with respect to your central value, that can already let us uh, estimate uh, the, the covariance for uncertainties. So as you're, you know, working in your analyses, I really strongly encourage you to do this. Um, I think it'll give you, it will, uh, you know, certainly encourage us uh, working on analyses, these basic analyses to try and include your results um, because we were able to much better understand what we're working with. Um, the, the other thing that I'll, I'll highlight, and I think this has already been well said, but I, uh, you know, don't think it's, I think it's important not to overlook, um, you know, these basic analyses are tremendously powerful. Um, and I, I certainly think they're absolutely worth the work, but, you know, be aware of, of what you're doing if you're, if you start to pick up one of these analyses, you know, it takes a bit of work to try and organize these things and, you know, calculate your observables, running your calculations, et cetera. So, uh, you know, don't let that discourage you. I think it's a, a, a really incredibly interesting approach and certainly worth your time, but, uh, you know, be cognizant of, of uh, you know, what, Kind of what efforts you're you're working on, right? A lot of what we've shown you in these hands-on, we've kind of glossed over some of these difficult details, um, you know, to let you focus on on the things that matter. But uh, you know, don't forget about this. Okay, so with that, uh, I think let's go let's go to our hands-on. Let's go try some things out. Um, and I guess some preemptive thanks to all the the TAs here as well as the the session chairs. Thanks. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Raymond. Uh, any questions uh, from the students, uh, either on, oh, there's a one question on the Slack channel. And I think this is for Raymond here. Okay. Uh, so Raymond, do you want me to read it out or do you want to- Oh yeah, it? sorry, could, yeah, sorry. Okay, I can flip over to Slack. Uh, yeah, either way. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, would it be better to consider a different observable like QAA, which is a better proxy for energy loss? Um, um, yeah, so so uh, I think there's there's kind of two questions. So okay, there's two parts of the question. So one, considering a, a different observable like the QAA, uh, I think certainly it could be very interesting. I mean, so one way you could think about these types of problems, right? If I go back to my uh, you know, we have a, okay, I can't find my slides now, great. Um, we have a wealth of, of uh, uh, maybe it's full screen, okay, there we go. Right, we have this whole collection of jet observables. Um, so one, you could try and recast the, the RA in a different way, or one, you could try and include different observables uh, with different information. I think all of this is a really, uh, a really positive direction to go. Um, there's a ton of face space to, to try and look at. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to ask the question of what observables really contain the most information is, is really quite, uh, okay. Uh, so, so one thing you could do, for example, um, with a Bayesian analysis is you could try and calibrate it on some subset of data and start adding in different observables, seeing how those new observables change the constraints you have on your posterior distribution. Um, and this can really be, you know, quite powerful. For example, if an experiment asks, uh, you know, what observable should we try and measure next? Right, you can try and give them some some insight in that direction. So, uh, in terms of of uh, you know what would be you know whether it be useful to look at other ones, absolutely. Um, to answer the second part of the question uh, about the tension at, at uh, between the hadron and jet RAA at low PT, um, yeah. So I think there could be uh, right. So so it depends on kind of how low PT we're talking, of course. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, in general, certainly details of like the, the particularities of the, the hydronization could matter. Um, th there's a lot of details that could could uh, impact this, you know, including up to just the, the model description. Um, 
right? We know there, there are some parameters that this model can do quite well for describing the, the Hadron and the Jet REA. So, you know, one has to look at this very carefully. Um, in this case, I want to emphasize that we're really, this is a work in progress. This is a first look with some subset of our, our simulations. Um, so uh, your question is really interesting. I, I very much want to know, and I want to try and disentangle these, these uh, details. Um, we're not quite at the point where we can do that yet, but it's certainly something of interest. Um, one could also try and apply, for example, um, you know, some of these uh, techniques we had described yesterday, where you try and, you know, for example, vary heterogenization models or something uh, to try and extract some more information there. So all of this would be excellent. Uh, I'm very excited to see where it goes. Uh, uh, but yeah, not, not quite there yet. Uh, that was quite a long response. I hope uh, <laughs> if you if you have a follow up, please go ahead. Uh, but I hope I at least covered what you're thinking about. No, it was uh, it was very comprehensive. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. All right, okay. great. Um, any other questions? Uh, either on Slack or Zoom, or just feel free to sort of uh, call it out. Um, if not, then we can perhaps move to the, the hands-on session. Should should we take a... Like oh, yes, 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 yes. That, that's a good point, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so how about this? Um, I think we're ahead of schedule. Uh, Raymond, how long is the... Um, how long do you anticipate the, the hands-on session to be? I don't have a precise estimate. I don't think... I, I wasn't expecting to use my full time, though. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think so. Uh, we could have a, a maybe like a fifteen minute break, and then uh, reconvene at um, ten twenty five. If that sounds good to you, so sure. Minutes. That works for me. Ten twenty five. Right. Sounds good. So um, right. So uh, we can take a break now, and we'll uh, come back and start hands on session at ten twenty five. Right. Thanks. Great. Thanks. <laughs>